Okay, welcome back. It's hard to believe that a month has already gone by since the beginning of the semester. All the, the fun, the good times we have. I'm going to review quickly a series of announcements. Then, as usual, for a Tuesday, I will illustrate the details for week five, including the assignment, there is a written assignment that is due for the week after this. I'm going to spend the bulk of this class analyzing the text of Jules Verne's The Master of the World. And following that, either today or Thursday, we're going to engage in a class activity centered on the analysis of the text the language used in reference to technology and society in preparation for this next written assignment. So I found the time this morning to go open all the files and review all the participation activities, all the comments you left when we watched the scenes of Bumblebee or soon after that I said in class if you don't do it in class because you want to focus your attention on the scenes that's fine as long as you add your comments within a couple of days or by the end of the weekend these assignments these comments rather count for participation I don't give the grade but you'll find they're excellent very good good etc so you, you have a rough idea of where you stand. If you have any questions, of course, if you want me to provide more precise feedback, you just have to ask. On Saturday, I went to the Concorso di Leganza here at Stony Brook in the lawn near the sports complex. It was a gorgeous morning. The light was perfect. I've never found so many well-kept and well-polished, well-presented cars. So I took quite a few pictures and, and they came out very well. And I therefore produced a wide selection, which I posted on SmackMag. And you can click on the link. The page is open to the public. It was made available to the participants. Uh, to the concorso and you just have to click on any picture to zoom in and then you can move from one to the other. There weren't many very old cars, just a few cars from the 1950s and 60s, a few more from the 1970s, a lot more cars that were more modern, but a few interesting exemplars, a few interesting items, cars that are somewhat rare or exceptionally kept, exceptionally restored. So just for your curiosity, to get a better idea, for example, when I was talking at the beginning of the semester about the greater variety of styles designs and technical solutions that existed in the automotive industry and in the market in the past. The visuals just showing at this slideshow gives you evidence, give you, gives you a better sense of what I'm referring to. There was another show on the 17th in Bridgehampton and this has been going on now for six years it takes place on a golf course that was built where the original racetrack of, of Bridgehampton existed where the uh, gentlemen drivers uh, the celebrities of those times came to race their sports cars or race cars uh, and and the racetrack survived until the 1990s, although it was already crumbling. Now they have a high level exhibition show. Unfortunately, it's invitation only. 
and the collection rivals that of the more prestigious shows that you find usually in California. The article is by a local car historian and collector, Howard Kroplick, who after he retired, he was in the marketing business, marketing and PR. After he retired, he purchased the car that won the 1908 Vanderbilt Cup race, which was the first international race organized in the US, and it was organized here on Long Island for a number of years until the 1930s. He became a historian of that race and also a historian of the Vanderbilt Highway, which has now become the Long Island Expressway. And in turn, that highway was the first highway with tall boots and uh, modern highway. Okay, so more links in there if you don't know what I'm talking about and you want to explore. I added a separate page with some notes and quotes about Bumblebee in case you need to review what was said on Friday. Of course, the notes are somewhat quick. At the same time, of course, we're not going to talk any longer about this film, but I went to my YouTube channel and retrieved the lecture I offered in September 2021. And this is, this is exactly a visual and thematic analysis of the film conducted through a series of shots taken, frames taken from the film. So in case you're curious or in case you missed that class, you may want to avail yourself of this YouTube video. Last week I posted this interesting video, forgot to mention it, I believe, um, but uh, it's quite interesting for our topic to note that this company, which has always had financial trouble, but very interesting design ideas, Canoe, managed to secure a contract for the sale of 4,500 of these electric van delivery vehicles to Walmart. And uh, they make an interesting use of the space for, for one thing, as you can see in the uh, video, the front is all glass or most glass. And uh, not only you can see in front of you, but there is a space at the center where you can see the road uh, underneath. Uh, and um, the vehicle is sold in different configurations, including the passenger's vehicles. Vehicle is not longer than a BMW series of, of the Series 5, the 5 Series. But again, there is a lot of space inside. So this might be in our future, right? And this could be an attempt yet another attempt by Walmart to try and replace Amazon in the online ordering and delivery business. The video has some interesting numbers. They say that something like 90% of all Americans live within 10 miles of a Walmart store. If it is not 90, it might be 80, but it's still a staggering number. This is week five, the page for week five. So this week we're going to analyze the text from Jules Verne. So we've introduced the theme, but now we want to see how the text shows evidence of what we've been saying about Verne's attitude towards technology, a pessimist attitude, and an attitude that is uh, shaped by a moralistic view of society in general, of the individuals within society in particular. So you find the same readings that have been assigned so far, and I added a separate page that I will use today with a series of passages and a series of highlights where I formatted in bold all the keywords that speak, the vocabulary that speaks to the themes 
of this book in reference to technology. Again, we'll try the class activity today or Thursday. If there is a t time, I want to say something about this dark novel, the, the black motor car, because it is a novel from the same period with another moralistic view of the technology of the automobile. It is very much good versus evil and a dark kind of novel. So with another pessimistic view of the automobile, this has not been assigned, will not be a required reading. It's just for reference so that you have a broader view of the literature on the topic. The movie for this week and the next will be a nice little horror movie from 1983 by a master of the genre. John Carpenter is the director. He also wrote some of the music. He's also, he's also a music composer. And uh, we'll, we'll see some scenes. And as usual, you find a separate page with some notes. We will start by discussing the similarities between Christine Bumblebee and the love bug in the treatment of the car and how the car is worked into the plot. I added a section about a possible remake of Christine. It seemed last year that a remake was in the making, that they had secured uh, funding, they had the cast, they were about to go into shooting, although a date was not given. And as you can see, nothing has happened. Now they're talking about the possibility of shooting the movie this year or even next year. But uh, Stephen King himself is kind of skeptical about this remake and he doesn't really like remakes of movies or films made on his books, based on his books, because many of them are well made. And so how can you top the original, as, as you will see. In fact, even in the case of Christine, they, they made a digitally remastered version. Doesn't add anything. Even with the old film, the old grainy film, and, and the old color is still enjoyable. Next reading is about a novel we will discuss next week. The Lightning Conductor was the first global uh, bestseller on the automobile, selling about a couple of million copies. It was written by a couple, Charles and Alice Williamson, but Alice was really the writer and the mind uh, behind this. And we'll discuss the reasons why they would present themselves as a couple a married couple authoring the book instead of having her uh, uh, show up as the uh, author. This is the assignment. I'll show you quickly the instructions because as I said, when we go through the activity in class, then I can add more detail. And the activity is meant to send you in the right direction. The title is Fast Technologies between fear and fascinations, fascination. And the focus is the representation of positive and negative reactions to the manifestation of or the interaction with the new disruptive technology found in the science fiction novel by Jules Verne. Okay? And as usual, it doesn't have to be a mini paper. And really, the strength of this assignment for you should be how good are the examples. You don't want to offer a long catalog of quick examples. You want to find two or three strong examples and analyze them well. Maybe one might be enough, uh, depending on how uh, specifically detailed the example is. And around that, you want to build your argument. Start from the bottom up. Don't start with a thesis and then look for confirmation. And that is worth 4% of the final grade or 4 points for participation. 
with the proviso that you should get to at least 15 points out of 25 participation with these assignments and usually there are three, four, four points. Here it is. So what are we doing today? As I said before, we are looking for the vocabulary, the keywords that signal the treatment of the topic and confirm the general statement I offered about this novel and about its genre for that particular period, the idea that there is a pessimistic, uh, moralistic view of the technology and the, the position taken by the writer for the reader is that we should reject, we should be aware and possibly reject advanced technologies altogether if we are not as humankind, as human individuals, mature enough or good enough. And that's where the issue of morality comes back into play. Besides highlighting, as you will see, uh, uh, I use colors, I use formatting, besides highlighting the keywords and key passages, I also destructured them. I unpacked them to show you the structure, the syntactical structure, because that also explains the rhetorical approach to the treatment of technology, which is based on techniques that have been part of Western literature for the past 3,000 years. And I'm referring in particular to amplification, accumulation, and speculation. Speculation is typical even today of commercial literature, B-level entertainment novels. That is to say, instead of just showing the actions of the characters or describing what the characters have to say, the narrator, the narrator's voice, pauses to pose a series of scenarios, speculating what might happen in the story, how the story might proceed, or how a critical issue in the story might be resolved. In the case of Jules Verne, you, you cannot uh, uh, miss the speculative passages because they're populated with question mark. So what is this? Uh, are, are these the signs of a volcano that is about to erupt? And if the volcano is about to erupt, what is, it go what is going to happen? If there is water underneath the volcano, will the water turn into steam? And will the steam cause an explosion because of the humongous pressure on the walls of the mountain? And if there is an eruption, will the uh, countryside, the territories around the volcano, be flooded with molten lava? And which uh, villages and countries uh, and towns will be affected and will people die, etc., etc. Okay, so this is done to create tension in a very mechanical way, to create suspension, also to open up the narrative, right? Which is another technique that you find very frequently used in films at the beginning of a film. That'll be these days the most complicated part of the film because so many different possible threads are opened, so many different scenarios are hinted to, and then usually because of the imbalance between the beginning and the end, the conclusion will generally be disappointing because some of these scenarios will just be ignored. So no explanation given why that scenario was possible or why that scenario never came true, right? Because the conclusion has to come 
quickly enough, but the beginning has to get the people into the story. So that is what is done by movies, by TV series, overcomplicate the, the, the plot at the front to overload the front of the story with possibilities and then to abandon, just to abandon some of them and to get to an acceptable conclusion. Accumulation and amplification are very similar and they overlap. Amplification means to be emphatic about something, to be repetitive or redundant. And this is done a lot. For example, you will see how the vocabulary is overloaded with terms such as fear, danger, and their synonyms. Accumulation refers to the use of lists. So, Vern might say, if there is this volcanic eruption, who will die? The men, the women, the babies, the animals. And then mixing accumulation and amplification, saying the animals is not enough, and following that statement, you have a list of the animals, the hens, the sheep, the cows, the dogs. Right. So this, of course, is done usually to dramatize the narrative, to load the narrative with negative tension. When it comes to the moralistic side of this, keep in mind what are the social and individual sins highlighted by the author. And you find a recurring critical treatment of curiosity, Yes, people are curious to know what is that is going on in their area in this mountain called the Great Erie, whether it's a volcano, a monster, or something else. But curiosity in the average population, in the populace, in this book, in this novel, is also a negative quality for two reasons. One, because this curiosity is not targeting just the main concerns, but in general, people are curious in a vain kind of way. And the second way curiosity is seen as negative is that if you're curious, but you don't take the initiative because you're gregarious, like the population, the populace is represented in this novel, then it, it's a waste of, of time, right? If, you're, if curiosity is to be a virtue, then it should prompt your exploration or your reaction, taking some initiative to remedy what you see as a possible danger or a mysterious force that might turn out to be a force of evil. As I said before, generally gregariousness is identified in the bulk of society among the citizens and criticize there is a conservative, a paternalistic view of society whereby most people in society are brutes. They react like animals when faced with any kind of emotional situation or critical situation, and they are in sore need of leadership, of guidance, of proper information and education but that education doesn't come, cannot come from the media because the newspapers are criticized by Verne multiple times, criticizing them because they just want to increase the sales by uh, uh, making this into a story, into a very dramatic story, instead of really educating the population. And greed is another sin which is seen in society and not only at the level of the general population or the single individuals, but also at the level of the government because there is a criticism in some of these passages and then in the rest of the book, that uh, a criticism levied against the nationalist governments who are competing with each other on two fronts, the industrial front they're competing for economic growth and economic power. 
and on the military front, they're competing for the control of the world. And therefore, the moral shortcomings of the individuals, the moral shortcomings or the absence of leadership at the national level all together represent the response or the justification to the rejection of the technology. This technology cannot be adopted because in the hands of individuals who are not moral, who do not possess or practice the proper moral values, would produce even worse distraction, worse than the distraction and damages, the suffering inflicted by the madman, by robber, by the inventor of this machine called the terror, okay? So, let's see. This is the very beginning of the novel, chapter one, and to confirm that this is a book with a moral lesson or message, you find at the beginning, in the initial paragraphs, a typical statement for a text from the Middle Ages on that needs to instruct the reader not just to entertain but also to educate the reader in a moralistic or a moral ethical way. And that is the statement of legitimacy and truth. Why should you believe what you're about to read? Well, it comes from allegedly an eyewitness and an actor in the events, John Strzok. And John Strzok, the federal agent who will be taken, eventually kidnapped and taken on board this machine, says it is important that you, that you should believe you, my word. And understand the implied message. Believe, right, which is taken from the language of religion, and important to stress that there is a logical connection between these two things. If you believe what you're reading, then there is some important message, some important changes that should happen, take place in your life after reading this, okay? Now, of course, this is part of, of a transaction with the reader, right? You understand me that when this was published in 1904, it's not like people actually read and believed it was true. Whenever you find this from Dante's The Divine Comedy to Jules Verne, whenever you find this kind of statement, it's a social game between the writer and the reader, meaning read this as if it were true, because if you do, then some important consequences will happen, will be acknowledged, and this is a book that is supposed to change you and not just to entertain you, okay? This is the extent of this truth statement. It's not meant to convince anyone that this has actually happened, this part of a game. I can bring no other testimony than my own, by itself, is the statement of legitimacy. That is to say, meaning I am legitimized, I am enforced, empowered enough to be the uh, uh, caretaker of the truth of these events because I was involved directly in these events. And in this case, it's not even the Middle Ages. You, you go back to the ancient Greeks or to the Bible for this kind of statement, right? You read the Gospel of John, for example, and uh, right, right after the philosophical introduction, the first story you find is the story of a meeting between Jesus and two of the apostles, meaning Believe this because this gospel has been written by people who met Jesus, were part of the events, and therefore they can vouch for the truth of what you read in here. What follows is a series of premonitions and signs that anticipate the revelation, the full, the, the, the initial and then the clearer revelation of the technology and this is a typical passage where you find this series of hypothetical scenarios and multiple reasons for concern so it doesn't matter whether you believe this or not 
but the accumulation of all these references to catastrophic natural events is meant to produce a state of tension, right? We're talking about the site of an ancient volca volcano, but this is not something that anyone can verify, so it's an hypothesis and therefore part of the mystery. And the mystery makes it more concerning because you cannot study it. A volcano that has slept through the ages. So we're talking about something that is hidden, hidden by the rock and hidden through time. Therefore, more mysterious. And we're talking about the possibility that since you cannot see inside the mountain, there may be inner fires, right? And these fires might be awake in the form of an eruption. And then, again, just follow the keywords because I'm going to go through this quickly, as quickly as I can. There are references to violence and disaster and names, you can click on the links, of two famous volcanoes Mount Krakatoa erupted in 1883, and it was considered to be the most uh, powerful eruption known to humankind in the history of humankind. Mount Pele happened 19 years later in 1902 in the Martinique. Krakatoa was in Indonesia, and uh, 20 to 30,000 people died, and therefore, given the period, 1883, 1902, both events were widely covered by the press and most people knew those names, could recognize those names. So by themselves, even those names are negative flags, right? Flags of disaster. Then again, there is the other scenario. Is there a lake hidden from sight within the volcano that we cannot see? If so, what happens? We have danger, we have steam. Steam here considered as a powerful and potentially destructive force, and we have a tremendous explosion that is possible. And this tremendous explosion would be deluging the fair plains of Carolina, amplifying the effect of the first statement, how with an eruption similar to the one in 1902 in Martinique, that would be Mount Pelé. Amplification because Mount Pelé is already being mentioned, and now it is being mentioned again. There have been symptoms recently observed. They're not even signed. They're symptoms so that you know that this is a negative situation, like an illness that is occurring in society. What are these symptoms? Smoke, which is mentioned several times, of course, smoke takes your away, away your ability to, to see. So it makes you in a condition of uh, inability to control your surroundings. And then other signs or symptoms, rather subterranean noises, unexplainable rumblings. These are part of the surprise of the mystery that is building up. That, that being built up in this novel, again, in a rather rudimentary fashion, right? It's a, it's a rhetorical fashion. Show me the actions. Show me what is going on instead of speculating about it. And it's, and, and it's easier to write a longer book this way because essentially you're swelling, you're, you're inflating the narrative with things that are not necessary to the story because they're stories about something that is not what is going to happen or the origin of this. And if anything, you can show me people discussing this or their reaction to these signs, but that's not exactly what Bert is doing. Regrettable is the language of morality, right? What is regrettable about this? Regrettable means that something should have been done and was not done. What is that was not done? Nobody went there. Nobody was ever able to find a way, a path to climb on top of this mountain, which doesn't exist. This was invented by Vern, the Great Erie Mountain, this alleged dormant volcano. 
So regrettable means that humans are lacking. For example, they would be much safer if someone had taken the initiative, not just being curious about it, but taken the initiative to go there and see there is a lake, there is smoke, there is a fire, inner fire, etc., etc. And what is regrettable is that mountain climbers, climbers have never found a path, never been up there. But look at the responsibility that not climbing, not going there uh, bears. If a volcanic eruption menaced all the western region of the Carolinas, then it would be important to go there, right? So it's very regrettable that no one did, because such is human nature. They, they can be curious, they can worry with words or nervously, but they don't act on it. And leadership is not sending someone there either. That's the implication. So the language of crisis, many serious difficulties in uh, climbing this mountain. So they try with the available technology. They try sending a hot air balloon, but this technology simply shows the evidence of the inability of humans to control nature. Their technology is so primitive that they're still in the hands of nature. So this hot air balloon fails because they need to rely on winds carrying them in the direction, in the general direction of the mountain. But what happens is that first, they, they, they stop me there and then they they're, they're pushed in a different direction okay so keep in mind that even references to powerful glass here powerful telescopes in another work as references to technology for the time even telescopes binoculars are considered advanced technology for that time, again, must fear an eruption, insistence on this concern, which is misplaced. Okay, so lack of control, the hot air balloon remains motionless, then unlucky chance, unlucky chance tells you this is not a technology that can overpower nature. It relies too heavily on nature. Therefore, if you go up in a balloon, you are at the mercy of nature. You're not in control. You're not more powerful because you invented this technology. The balloon was caught in an adverse current, began to drift, and drift, of course, represents also a lack of control. So despite all the efforts, humans are not powerful enough against nature. They disappear on the wrong horizon, and then they land somewhere else. What are some of the initial reactions of the people? Again, the language of mystery and surprise, we're talking about strange phenomena, and the reaction is nervous, right? Disquieted, disquiet, mentioned twice in two consecutive sentences, and the curiosity. This impedious need of knowing the true condition of the mountain is in fact ironic. Right? Because as I said before, whenever you find a reference to curiosity, you have to connect that, associate that with the lack of proper initiative to find the knowledge that people are curious about. The newspapers here, and then later in other places being criticized for their lack of leadership, they have flaring headlines, meaning that they're useless. They're just trying to build a story, right? Of course, not much has changed, right? We were three, three months from now, Channel 12 will be telling us, snow is coming, it could be one inch or 13 feet, right? One inch will be the fine print and 13 feet will be what will be blared through from, from the screen. So the mystery of Great Erie, mystery, the language of surprise and mystery, Dangerous, danger, dangerous is everywhere here. Curiosity and fear. But this kind of curiosity is a morbid, a useless kind of quality, not a good motivator. Because this is curiosity among the people who are not there, are not in a position of danger, 
And so it's a morbid curiosity because someone might be dying soon in this disaster, but it's not them. And therefore, it's just a strange phenomenon of nature. And fear, well, the people who live there could become victims of a catastrophe, the language of danger again, yet no one is doing anything about it, or no one is reclaiming from, uh, demanding from the authorities that a governmental plan be set in place. Who is being threatened? And you find here the accumulation in the form of a list, right? And the list is not even one of the longest. The citizens of Morganton, the largest town near this fake Mount Erie mountain, even more, the good folk of Pleasant Garden, the hamlets, farms yet closer to the mountains. So, failure to accomplish the recognizance mission over the volcano brings over more concerns because you have more symptoms, fresh rumbling, heavy clouds, clouds, smoke are recurrent in a, in a pattern of not being able to know what is there, wavering glimmering of light at night with emphasis on night and there are multiple references to the night. Night is like smoke, not being able to see is part of the mystery, right? Good people are not supposed to be out at night and you cannot see much anyway. So there comes the realization, but this realization is also ironic, ironic, right? Because we know that this is not true. There is serious and imminent danger. So these are the key words for the theme of danger. The entire country, this is amplification. Not only is this a drama, but is a drama that affects a large territory. So there is no escape. The entire country, the threat of some seismic or volcanic disaster. Right? And the apprehensions, vague apprehensions, vague is a criticism of the populace, right? They're worried, but they don't want to know more. The educated turn into panic. This is the animalistic reaction that I referred to earlier. Again, the newspapers being criticized one, once more, instead of being a force of good, being a positive influence, they gave prompt echo to the public terror. They just steer the situation in a bad way. Corruption, of course, being mentioned again. And then there is the night of the alleged eruption, which is not to be. The citizens of this town, Pleasant Garden, which is the closest, although not the largest, but the closest to the volcano, are awakened by a sudden uproar, where the uproar is this mysterious noise, right? It's all the language of mystery. What is that they're thinking? That the mountains were falling upon them. Because again, they're being described as if they were children, right? So it's kind of a primitive, brutalist, kind of fear, right? The sky is falling upon me, the mountains are falling upon me. So they rush from their houses, they rush because theirs is a nervous reaction, they are not able to apply reason, they just run out, they're ready to flee, and they have this fear, before it was that the mountain were falling upon them, now fear that an immense hole, an abyss, will open under their feet and uh, this will take villages for miles around. Again, this, there is this horizontal geographic amplification of the potential disaster. The theme of darkness, this it happens inside a night where, where, where the obscurity is impenetrable, so you cannot see. Again, you're at the mercy of nature. And there was no response to the cries, right? Is an implied criticism of the local leadership, the local authorities, and the cries arose from every side, this horizontal application. 
again. And see, look at the list once again. Frightened groups of men, women, and children grope their way. Another reference to the absolute obscurity. Black roads, again, another reference to obscurity, darkness. In wild confusion, they're behaving like animals irrationally from every quarter. This is a universal condition in the area. In the screaming voices, the language of drama, earthquake, eruption, fire, and ignoring the cause makes it even worse. So again, references to conflagration, fire, flames, the ignorance of the cause, and multiple scream, multiple people screaming, an eruption, an eruption, and again, the cry is from all sides, meaning you cannot escape to this because it involves a large territory. Eruption yet once more, references to it through the language of volcanology, the crater of the volcano, the bowels of the mountain, the idea that this has something to do with the ancient history of the mountains, another reference to flames or to a rain of stones and ashes, lava, molten fire, destroying everything, annihilating, and then yet another list, but this time the lists are getting longer. What is being destroyed and annihilated, because destroy was not enough, they needed to amplify the towns, the villages, the farms, and nature. But it's not just nature, all this beautiful world of meadows, fields, forests, and that is not enough. You need to put it in a place as far as Pleasant Garden and Morganton. Panic, again, this idea that the people react in an animalistic way, overwhelming, that they cannot use their mind to control the situation or their reaction, nothing can stop it, and another list with accumulation and amplification, women and infants, infants crazed with terror. They rush out because they're taken by terror, so rush is another way to amplify the idea of terror. Men deserting their home. Why deserting? Because they're abandoning what is their duty as men, which is to uh, uh, protect their family and defend their property. They hurry in taking their belongings, and then they let go of the animals, but instead of just saying that you find livestock first, and then cows, sheep, pigs, and all directions, this constant reference to the fact that this affects a large territory. And the chaos that follows, the disorder, agglomeration is another way to say that they come together in a chaotic way, is amplified through the use of a list. So the agglomeration is human and animal. It happens under darkest night, which is the fifth time we're reminded of this. Amid forests, and, for, and nature itself is seen in a kind of negative way threatened by the fires in the volcano, along the border of marshes. There is no saving oneself, right? If you're not uh, killed by the ashes or by the fires or by the stones, then you drown in the marshes. Because the waters of the marshes might overflow. The earth is threatening to disappear under the feet of the fugitives. and. Is there time to save oneself? Again, another reference to lava. And all of this is a mad fly. People are not able to restrain themselves. However, there are a few who are natural leaders, but just a few who manage to bring back some order into this chaos, reassure the people that there is no evidence that an eruption is taking place and people will eventually go back to 
their houses, there are still flames, so there is still reason for concern. Meaning, this is not, was not nothing at all. And even talking about what didn't happen, Vern is repetitious, redundant, and therefore emphatic, right? Amplifying. No stones, no torrent of lava, no rumblings, no manifestations of seismic disturbance. Even in this case, instead of saying nothing happened, has to go through the list because even the negative list instills fear, tension, concern in the narrative. Now, what is that was missed and this is the first partial manifestation of the technology here comes the technology we have a strange noise we don't have a shape we don't have something visible but a presence a strange noise across the air a sort of whirring this is the machine flapping its wings the beating of mighty wings well, the wearing should be the turbine, turbines, and then you also have the beating of the wings. And look at the negative description of the technology. Look at the terms. It's a mighty bird of prey, which has something positive in it, but some fear, right, associated with it. Bird of prey. So it's mighty, but it's still a bird of prey, a monster of the skies. And the first reference to the immense speed of this vehicle, this device, which is the most worrisome quality and the principal qualities, quality of, of the technology. So again, we insist on the mystery of the great theory of the fact that this is important, meaning nothing, not enough is done about it, especially since the safety of the people is at stake. More ominous signs, more symptoms, strange occurrences in different parts of the state. Once again, this reference to how wide is the territory involved in this. We have an extraordinary vehicle, which is good, but it, it goes to the theme of surprise. No one could describe any of these details. Why? Because it has this enormous speed. Certainly it was an automobile, but we know it is more than that. And we don't know what kind of engine it has and what are the people trying to do they're trying to imagine what it is and come up with hypotheses instead of acting. Then there is this explanation that the cars of the period drove about 60 miles to give you a reference. Around 1904, the land speed record was around 95 miles per hour. It was the fastest land vehicle for that year. And allegedly this uh, kind of vehicle is, is driving at 130, 150 miles per hour. So this by itself makes it very different. Again, the word danger, extreme danger on the high roads, meaning in a place that is frequented by society, right? High roads are essential to the wealth, to the good functioning of society. The good functioning of society is therefore being threatened by this technology. Now they call it a Russian mass, which makes it mysterious and somewhat threatening, coming like a thunderbolt, which is not positive. And again, the rumbling, the reference to the rumbling, the whirlwind, that is strong enough to tear the branches off of the tree, terrifies the animals, scatter and kill the birds, because there, are, there is a tremendous air current. So 
everything around the description of the technology and its manifestation is somewhat negative. A bizarre detail, bizarre alluding to the mystery and therefore is something to be worried about. The surface of the road is not scratched. Keep in mind that if you travel on a road during this period, since most roads were not paved with stone or with asphalt or the equivalent of that, which was macadam, uh, you would have found the ruts, the uh, tracks left by heavy carts, right? Because basically you have dirt, dirt and stones, and therefore one cart after the other with the same width would have uh, uh, done these tracks more and more to the point where even people who drove automobiles on these streets were forced either to avoid these ruts, these tracks, or to drive the car on them. This vehicle does not leave such tracks because it is so quick that even the matter, the mass of the vehicle, is affected by the speed. There is this idea, this fantastic idea, that speed is not something that once you go from 10 miles to 150 miles changes in a scalar quantitative way. There is a qualitative shift to the point that this vehicle, even on the road, is almost blind. And the only sign is the dust that follows the, the cloud of dust that follows this vehicle. The extreme rapidity of motion destroys the weight. And this is one of the ideas in the book about speed. The other, even better emphasized, is the idea that the notion of space changes because space is not the sum of different points in a territory, point A, point B, point C, and you can move from one to the other. Speed makes it possible for someone to be everywhere almost instantly, and therefore space becomes a continuum. Of course, there are protestations which is another ironic treatment of the inability of people to react. And again, the speed is called mad speed, an apparition which will be used many times from this point on, speaks to the theme of mystery, okay? Again, the threat of the technology is very clear. Overthrow and destroy everything. And this is then explained, equipages meaning carriages, and people. Again, a reference to speed, dizzy flight. Dizzy was a common adjective used in reference to automobiles during the time. We'll find it even in Luigi Barzini's book about his travel, his journey from Beijing to Paris. And notice the metaphor, the reference to the artillery, the mouth of a gun, how can you, how could one seize a cannonball in the air? This is how fast it seems to be going, but at the same time, this is suggestive of how dangerous and destructive it could be. And it left behind no smoke, because it's not an internal combustion engine, no steam, it's not a steam car, no odor of, odor of gasoline, it's not a variation on an internal combustion engine, not any uh, or any other oil so it's not a traditional kind of engine so the conclusion is it runs by electricity but again this only adds to the mystery because what kind of accumulators or batteries are they using the model is unknown the fluid the chemistry the chemical is also unknown the public imagination is highly excited. This is the criticism of curiosity that I was talking about, right? It's just excitement, even in the face of danger. It's vain, it's useless curiosity, curiosity for the sake of it, right? And in fact, it translates into 
rumors. They're talking about the possibility of this being supernatural. By 1904, Verne could have read that in countries such as the United States, but also other places, people in the countryside were talking of, of automobiles as diabolical inventions, and oftentimes referring to chauffeurs, to drivers, as devils. Okay, So is it a supernatural car? But this is practically just another scenario, right? We went through the natural scenario. Is it a volcano? Now the supernatural scenario. Is it a diabolical being? And in the, in the movie Christine, the answer is yes. Christine is a diabolical being. That supernatural car, driven by a specter, a ghost, by a chauffeur from hell, a goblin, if you don't know about goblins, you can read, uh, you can click on the link, a monster, the devil himself, driving it, and if so, he, let's amplify this, he will define all human intervention, there is nothing that can be done, and he has, he can control invisible and infinite satanic powers. And then the irony against the leadership of society, of course, even if it is the devil, how can he, how dares he, does he dare, how can he dare drive without a permit, a license, etc., etc., in, in defiance of rules and policies. Another reference to the geographical dimension of this issue, right? The device was seen in Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, Missouri, Chicago, which also transition, the narr transitions the narrative towards the theme of space being redefined. And again, words such as alarm, danger, again, apparition, the reference to the speed and the reference to destruction right after that, smashed into a thousand pieces. The populace is discussing this without any meaningful conclusion, and they're still talking about the possibility that this is the devil, and the devil would have wings and be able to fly, and the machine can actually fly, and more references to the devil. The devil is called the king of Hades, Now we have the fuller apparition and revelation of the technology. The technology comes to disrupt a race, a car race in Wisconsin. So the race itself with regular automobile is seen in a negative way, right? Because they're talking about crowding, too many people are on the racetrack, accidents, accidents that must result from it. There is no race without accidents. Vern knew of races with a high rate of accidents and some of them lethal. The, one of the worst examples happened in fact was a race that started in France and had six or seven people die in 1902, I believe I can find the reference. So you find in this episode several references to the telephone because the telephone is supposed to give you a sense of the speed of this device. If the telephone is not quick enough to warn people who are in front of this car, of this mysterious vehicle, then this gives you a sense that the speed of the vehicle is almost like the speed of electricity or radio communication, however you want to look at it. Okay, so already there were, there were accidents because the automobile itself is dangerous. This must be even more dangerous. Chauffeurs, that is, race car drivers, have been injured. But even if they had been killed, that was part of the show. And it is true that people went to see races during this period expecting to witness accidents or even uh, the death of. Uh, drivers. It is true that people often died at the racetrack. For example, in the case of the Vanderbilt Cup races, there were several accidents, people who were killed by race cars, people who were there to see the Vanderbilt Cup race on Long Island, and 
because their cars could not be controlled, they ended up killing some of the spectators. What is the reaction of the populace to injuries and death on the racetrack before this mysterious vehicle appears? Excitement, which means this is a criticism of the morality of the people and the, of ultimately the reason why this technology has to be rejected. Okay, and again, in reference to vain curiosity and passions, right? Or the fury with which they place bet on the winner, which is another sin, the sin of greed. And suddenly, of course, suddenly introduces this mysterious apparition. Tremendous noise and rumbling, flying cloud of dust, all the signs are repeated, shrieks, and speculation about what might happen now. Scenario number one, there could be distraction with hundreds of victims because of this new vehicle. This cloud could be as strong as a hurricane, and no one can see it. So another way, first we had in the first part, the smoke, the night, and here is another way to uh, suggest that people are not in control of this phenomenon, cannot really see it with their eyes because it is too fast. It goes and it disappears in an instant, just smoke and dust, and a multiple references to the speed, I will like double the regular speed, and back to the language of fear and danger. Uproar, fear, infernal, police cannot stop it. It was supposed to be destroyed, but no one can get rid of it. And again, the devil, the car is driven by hellfire, Satan is driving, this is amplification because it's repetitious. We've heard this at this point three times, right? And if not the devil, then a mysterious chauffeur with unbelievable velocity, a mysterious machine, and a reference to fright, to the police being unable to do anything or to the surprise. And in here, a precise reference to the fact that telephones, even telephones cannot compete with a car. Even using a telephone, you cannot call ahead and tell people to move away in time. Reference to the driver, the terrible madman, and to possible distraction, right? This is another hypothetical scenario. They would be smashed, ground into powder, annihilated, etc. multiple references to velocity, such velocity that could act, they could scarcely be, seen, scarcely be seen, and left behind neither smoke nor sand, meaning even the material reality is different for this and the mysterious driver. Hidden inside the machine, the same that the fire inside the mountain in the alleged supposed volcano was not visible, and the ability of being everywhere at the same time. Let me bring this to a conclusion. This is a discussion that follows between John's head working for the federal agency and John Straw, the protagonist. And his boss says the vehicle is unpursuable, meaning again, lack of control. You cannot control this and faster than the phone. Of course, whoever is driving it is a criminal. And here is the key reference to the new notion of space. He did not move continuously from place to place, not going from point A to point B, even at this amazing speed, but seemed to appear only for a moment and then to vanish into thin air. They can be everywhere they want at the same time, almost. Then you have 
a reference to, we've seen this vehicle being disruptive to traffic on the roads, being disruptive to the race, and this is commercial traffic. The Northeast board, the seaboard, uh, Maine, Connecticut, Massachusetts, again, an appearance, no one can describe it because of the speed, moving body, because the fact that it's moving is the main quality, rapid evolution, another reference to speed, and then flash that out of sight, lightning speed, and the technologies of the period, telescopes, for example, used on ships cannot keep up with it. Now, this time, the scenario that is being speculated about is that this might be a sea monster, right? And we know it's kind of a mechanical application of the same techniques, right? Because no one can compete with it. So the, the sailors say it could be a great fish, could be a strange animal, could be a huge mammal, could be an unknown monster. And to amplify that, you have a list of monsters the dwellers, the legendary dwellers in the deep, and you can click and see more about those monsters, the krakens, krakens the octopuses, they're talking about the giant octopus uh, in, at the bottom of the oceans, the leviathans, the sea serpents, right? And, and they go through this possible scenario, what if this is a monster? But what is true is that the fishermen are afraid the military are not afraid because they have bigger uh, ships made of metal, metal, but they cannot stop it even with their guns. We now have a fuller revelation. I'm almost done. A fuller revelation. This is not a series of machines, one that goes in the air, one that goes on the road, one that goes on the water, but it's the same machine. And you find the usual references. This, however, is significant because it's the first for the narrative. It's the criticism of the governments and the criticism of nationalism. Once they come to realize that this is an extraordinary machine that can transform and travel through the air, on land, and on the sea, then the issue is not to protect society from possible distraction, potential distraction, is to appropriate the technology so that the governments can compete with each other. It should be the US before the European countries, because anyone who can either purchase or steal this technology will become more powerful. And clearly there is a moralistic, critical view of this effort to appropriate the technology instead of protecting the people, right? So everything I, I introduced at the beginning is now demonstrated. And uh, I have a few minutes if you have any questions. Uh, while the last people are signing, no, it's already signed the attendance. Any questions or comments? And of course, we'll do the activity on Thursday.